This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay then, uh, so I'd like to introduce our speaker, Kate Davison, who is about to submit her PhD at Sheffield tomorrow. (laughs) No pressure. (laughs) As soon as I get back to Sheffield. (laughs) about to submit her PhD on uh, humour and laughter uh, in 18th century England. Uh, her PhD was supervised by uh, Phil Withington. Um, I I'm early career, so there's not much of a backstory there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, thanks, um, thanks for having me. Thanks, Penny, for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm really delighted to be here, actually. And with a viva impending, I'm looking forward to your questions and comments and things. So. Um, I'm sure you'll help me to to sharpen up my ideas a bit. Um, So thank you for for inviting me. Um, So let's crack on with Ned Ward, who I think will be um, a familiar name to many, almost, probably, if not all of you here today. Um, He is best known as a satirist and has often been commended for the humorous and lively style with which he penned his works, and most notably in his 18-part walkabout tour of the Metropolis, The London Spy. Quotations from this and many of his other publications have been frequently used by historians to enliven their accounts, and that's historians from Thomas Babington Macaulay right up to the present, so he's very widely used. Through an industrious writing career, he achieved fame and admiration among his contemporaries. His readership seems to have been very wide. Although he's more often considered a writer of popular pamphlets, with all the vulgar connotations that that implies, Evidence from commonplace books and library catalogues actually suggests that his readers were just as likely to have been drawn from among the better sort. Moreover, his career coincided with a period of rapid expansion in the print industry, and his works were swept up in the developing book trade, reaching around England, into Scotland, Ireland, and even across the Atlantic to colonial North America. He achieved all of this without the sustenance of patronage, and in that sense, His was something of a commercial writing career. He wrote to make a living and thus sought to cater for the growing market for print. Um, As he put it, the condition of an author is much like that of a strumpet. The chiefest and most commendable talent admired in either is the knack of pleasing. And he or she amongst us that happily arrives to a perfection in that sort of witchcraft may enjoy the pleasure of being celebrated. Thanks, Penny. Ooh, it's kind of eerie. Can you still see? Yes, just about. Is that all right? One back up might be helpful, thank you. It's a test for my eyes. Um, so it's a knack of pleasing. And what I want to do in this paper is to unpack that claim a little bit. I want to consider how Ward had a knack for pleasing his, his readers in the 18th century. Why was he considered such a diverting read? Oh, my God. It's like a disco, isn't it? Knack of lighting. Yeah. Um, So why was he such a diverting read? And in doing so, I want to think about how ideas of laughter played out with respect to people, places, and circumstances. And in the first instance, I'm going to use contemporary theories of laughter to uncover why Ward's writing might have been funny to the people around him at the time. And then, secondly, I want to broaden the picture to think a little about how Ward can be used to throw light on ideas about laughter's place in political debate and social life. So essentially, what I want to do is to consider the theories and then through Ward to see how they might have looked in practice. So, this calls for a slightly different approach to the history of humour. Um, And so I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking about that and how that builds on what's done before. Uh, And in a sense, I think this will be related to much wider trends in the development of cultural history uh, over the last few decades and where social history has come back to the forefront in recent years. So first, since its first inception, the prime justification for studying humour in the past has been that it is historically contingent. The things that we see fit to laugh at, how cruelly, sympathetically, outrageously or reservedly we laugh, all vary with time, place and culture. And as Vic Gatchell's put it in his City of Laughter, the reflex of laughter is controlled by mental processes. And mental processes have histories. Studying laughter can take us to the heart of a generation's shifting attitudes, sensibilities, and anxieties. Now, this being the case, the common tactic in histories of humour has been to identify comic material in the past and then analyse it as a window on historical mentalities. 
perhaps the most influential in this approach was Robert Danton with his Great Cat Massacre, in which he analysed the seemingly bizarre incident of violence against our feline friends in 18th century Paris, something that is distinctly unfunny to modern eyes, but apparently hilarious to those involved at the time. Emphasising that people in the past do not think the way that we do, Danton argued that it's when historians are lost that they achieve their greatest work. So a joke that's in inexplicable today is very revealing when its contemporary symbolism uh, is unpacked. Indeed, when Keith Thomas called for attention to humour in history in his article in the Times Literary Supplement in 1979, it was because it allowed a deeper understanding of past lives and culture. We should not be content to stop at GM Young's famous injunction to keep on reading until we hear the people talking. Thomas urged instead that we should keep on reading until we can hear the people not just talking, but laughing. And so there's something peculiarly human about sharing a joke, and to share that joke across the centuries with people from the past conveys a sort of immediacy and closeness that historians are um, lucky to get to, I suppose, on occasion. But interpreting the symbols and meanings embedded in comic material in this way is an exercise in the cultural relativism that became the hallmark of the cultural turn in history. The rise of cultural history in the 1970s and 80s shifted the agenda away from explaining social change retrospectively and towards a deeper understanding of the past on its own terms. The pursuit of ideas, representations and discourses that this entailed opened up a range of new sources for historians, especially literary material, and humour and jokes are a part of that. And it also motivated a greater sensitivity to contemporary language and perceptions. The cultural turn brought great gains for historical understanding, but at its high watermark around the early 2000s, there was a growing concern that the turn might have turned too far, in a sense. The extent, the extent of attention to language and discourse uh, had become disconnected from a sense of the social context. The question of what lies beneath the web of representations began to nag, and there were doubts about the ability of discourse to explain change and causation. So in this context, there were calls to integrate the gains of the cultural approach, sorry, to integrate the gains of cultural approaches with traditional attention to social context, categories and practices. And indeed, there was even talk of a new social turn, um, like spinning tops, historians. Um, so what I've been trying to do in my wider work is to write a history of humour that musters these developments. It's to ground a cultural analysis of the humour in an understanding of its social context. To this end, the humour and the mentalities that it reveals are still an important part of the story. But so too is the social world of humour's production, distribution and reception. This includes attending to material conditions, political affiliations, and social relationships of the authors, uh, as well as the extent and nature of their readers, audiences, and the dissemination of their work. The impact of humour in politics and society is also a part of the story, which calls for close attention to perceptions of laughter's significance and consequences, and the way in which it was thought about, tolerated, or suppressed. But humour is an amorphous subject, and modern theorists have struggled with its definition. And it was also a problem in the 18th century. As one essay towards fixing the true standards of wit, humour, raillery, satire and ridicule put it in 1744, an attempt to do so was no easy or slight undertaking. And even then, the author lamented that it had been declared by writers of the greatest renown to exceed their reach and power. Humour's relationship to laughter is certainly not straightforward. Moreover, the humorous can be found in writing, in speech, image or action, and its tone can vary from the whimsical to the vicious. In various guises, it can be found almost anywhere and at any time, in political debate, in print, in a joke shared between friends, and so on. So in order to control the source base for such a nebulous subject and to tether it to a particular historical context, I've grounded my work in the central figure of Ned Ward. And doing so has allowed for a scrutiny of a greater variety of sources and different approaches, thereby bringing together all these different aspects of what I'm tentatively calling a social history of humour in this period. The idea is to write a humour that goes beyond the actual comic material itself. Now, taking one aspect of this work, you'll be pleased to hear, not all of it, 
Um, this paper considers contemporary theories about laughter and traces them into social practice through the life and works of Ward. In terms of theories, there was a considerable body of writing about laughter in this period, and that built upon a strong Renaissance tradition. There were a number of philosophical tracts written, including those by Francis Hutcheson and James Beattie, both philosophers, and sections of both were reprinted in periodicals and newspapers later in the century. The physician Peter Shaw translated a 150-page German pamphlet as Thoughts on Jesting, and there were frequent essays on related themes published throughout the century. Jest books were also produced in large numbers, and many were prefaced with discussions about laughter. These debates touched on questions of manners, health, sociability and social control, the purpose and limits of satire in society, and the relationship between the mind and the body. Indeed, laughter seemed to be everywhere. As Hutchison put it, laughter is plainly of considerable moment in human society. It seemed to be peculiar to the human condition, and it struck to the heart of questions about the fundamental nature of man. As one physician wrote, a connection of a rational soul to a human body constitutes our essence. So it is that man, of all animals, he alone, by the powers of his understanding, particularly his wit, can make a risable discovery, and from the structure of his body, express his joy at it, by the actions of his muscles and the repercussions of his voice. And more to the point, given its importance in various aspects of life, it was worth taking notice of all this debate. As another commentator put it, those who taste and brains would recognise that understanding laughter was important. A lack of interest would only prove your want of sense. So the aim here is to investigate some of these theories. It's to enrich an, abs uh, an abstract discussion of the mental processes that were thought to elicit laughter by showing how these played out in Ward's writing. Similarly, rather than a philosophical inquiry into the boundaries of acceptability in political satire, we can follow Ward into the courtroom to establish and explain exactly where the line was drawn at a particular moment. And we can pursue him into the taverns of the town to highlight the place of wit in sociability. Ideas and discourses show that laughter was of some significance in early 18th century society and culture, and the goal here is to see how that played out in practice. So, let's move on to Ward proper. And there really is no disputing the London Evening Post's assertion that he was a very voluminous author in prose and verse. Although he was, and actually still is, as I said, best known for the London spy, he was extraordinarily prolific beyond that. Uh, this chart shows his output broken down by year over the 40 years when he was first published in 1691 through to his death in 1731. In that time, you can see that there's barely a year that passes without a new title being released. In many years, he was very productive, especially around the turn of the century, 1700, and that's when The London Spy was published. It's when he's really hitting the big time as a writer. And this picture is all the more startling when later reprints and additions are added. And here they're shown in the light blue against the dark blue of his new releases. It's got a staggering presence in the print market. And overall, he wrote more than 100 separate titles, as well as numerous periodicals, miscellanies, and collections. Using different genres and styles, he drew on all the literary traditions and resources available at the time. Uh, so this pie chart shows a breakdown using some relatively rough categorizations of genre. It's not an exact science, and I am a historian, not a literary person, so you can criticize me on that. But the point is to indicate the sheer variety of his output in poetry and prose, and there's all kinds of things. Um, quite small, actually, sorry. Character writing, travel writing, dialogues, collections, miscellanies, periodicals, some fables, a few secret histories, and some narrative and non-narrative verses, all sorts of different things. And this variety is the clue to his first ability, sorry, it's clue, the first clue to his ability to divert his readers, and that's novelty. Those who repeated the same jokes over and over again were dismissed by the theorist of jesting, George Frederick Meyer, as living chronicles. And actually, just as an aside, the example that he chooses to use is university lecturers who wheel out the same jokes every year to their students. Um, so it's, it's been noticed, um, or there's precedent at least. Um, uh, so novelty. And similarly, a poem entitled The Art of Joking 
emphasise that wit is like children's toys for play. What's prized this hour, the next is thrown away. Ward's mix of genres and forms then helped to ensure that readers did not tire of his efforts. Yet across this variety of writing, there are common tropes and satirical devices that can be identified as characteristic of his style and that correspond to theories of laughter's triggers. And it's to these that I want to turn now. Uh, trying to drink this, <coughs> trying to drink my tea before it goes cold. <coughs> so, the um, at the risk of spoiling some of these jokes, let's let's have a go. Um, the first is incongruity, the notion that bringing together ill-suited pairings of ideas, images, or situations would cause laughter. In particular, Hutchison noted the comic potential of pairing dignity and meanness. That is, juxtaposing something highbrow with something low. So we can see this in action in Ward's writing when he visited the Tower of London in the London Spy. He viewed the majesty of John, Gaunt's, John of Gaunt's suit of armour and was full of admiration for its strength and stature. But he swiftly shifted attention from that grandeur to his very codpiece, which, we are told, was almost as big as a poop lantern and better worth a lewd lady's admiration than any piece of antiquity in the tower. Similarly, on a trip to a coffee house at the height of the Reformation of Manners campaigns in the 1690s, he noticed a copy of the Act Against Profanity pasted to the wall, but it was adjacent to a shelf on which sat a jar of pills to cure venereal disease. And later on, he met a parson who emptied his pockets to reveal a common prayer book as well as a corkscrew. The one was to nourish the soul and the other the body equipped. This yoking together of dignity and meanness can also be seen when a plucky underdog brings a social superior down to size. It's the fall from grace, as Hutchison put it, any little accident befalling a person of great gravity. And we can see this when the spy teased the constable who stopped him in the street one night. Challenged for being out so late, the constable pointed out, every honest man ought to have been in bed an hour or two ago. To which the spy retorted, that's true, for nobody ought to be up so late, but constables and their watchers. It's so that kind of dignity of office made to look a little bit silly. Along with these kinds of incongruous juxtapositions, a second device that was thought to generate laughter was identifying similarity between two objects that were ostensibly different. In fact, this was considered the very essence of wit, from Thomas Hobbes through to John Locke, Francis Hutcheson, and later in the century, James Beattie. He wrote, laughter often arises from the discovery of unexpected likeness between objects apparently dissimilar. The more striking the opposition of contrariety and relation, and the more lively the risable emotion. He continued, readily to find out similitudes that are not obvious and were never found out before is no ordinary talent. The person possessed of it is called a man of wit. So it's a really admired skill, it's a kind of mental agility. And I think there's no accident that when Thomas Hobbes writes about wit in Leviathan, it's under his chapter, The Virtues Intellectual. So it's a, a mental skill. Um, and more broadly, just like novelty, surprise was a standard plank in theories of laughter. It was a joke's unexpected pleasure that delights us most. Spotting these kinds of surprise similarities and likenesses really was Ward's bread and butter in writing especially as he was so given to similes and metaphors, as anyone who has read some of his stuff will know. In his trip to Jamaica, he described some of the local cuisine. They grow greatly abound in a beautiful fruit, not unlike an apple, but longer. It's soft and very juicy, but so great an acid and of a nature so restringent that by eating of one of it, it drew up my mouth like a hen's fundament. The sash windows at the Covent Garden Turkish Baths were no broader than a Deptford cheesecake. A bow at Islington Pleasure Garden had a wig, handkerchief, gloves and cravat that smelt sweet as the arse of a Muscovy cat. While at the Lord Mayor's Parade on Cheapside, the spy was so closely imprisoned between the bums and bellies of the multitude that he was almost squeezed as flat as a napkin in a press. Now, the wit of writing such as this was thought to be all the better when conveyed in what Beattie called concise, perspicuous, and natural language. And this really is where Ward hits his stride. This is greater strength. His vocabulary deployed canting terms and synonyms promiscuously, 
almost to the point where nothing is called by its usual name. And some examples of these include have belly timber for food, mouth grenade for inflammatory speech, a prattle box for a talkative person, quill driver, one whose job involves uninspiring writing, reviving juice for drink, especially alcoholic, a sauce box, a troublesome person, a snoring kennel for a bedroom, and stinkabus, bad liquor, especially spirits. It's just a tiny handful of the many, many that he used. And turning to the theory once more, we can see that language itself was recognised as a source of humour. Beattie wrote, Colloquial oaths and forms of compliments, the ungrammatical phrases of conversations, the dialect peculiar to certain trades, the jargon of beggars, thieves, gamblers and fops, foreign and provincial barbarisms and the like, these, if intelligible, may be introduced into burlesque writing with good effect. So using canting language brought to life to people, sorry, brought life to the people that he encountered in their own words, always in plain style, typically lively and often confrontational. His brushes with the Thames Waterman are perhaps the most extensive example of a device that he used often. When the spy took a boat across the Thames, he was treated to what he called an academy of ill language, as the watermen bantered back and forth with one another. No sooner were they afloat than they attracted a volley of abuse from a waterman on another boat. How dare you show your ugly faces upon the River Thames and fright the Queen's swans from holding their heads above the water? Clearing his throat with a <coughs> the spy's boatman returned, you lousy starved crew of worm pickers and snail catchers, you offspring of a dunghill and brothers to a pumpkin, who can't afford to butter your cabbage or bacon your sprouts. From another boat, the spy was chastised by a gaggle of women this time. But once again, his boatman, being well skilled in the water dialect, returned the favour. After a puff and a pull up, he accused the women of being, among other things, a dirty salt ass brood of night walkers and shoplifters. One further vessel passed by with customary abuse. As the spy noted in an ironic tone, the passengers were eager, like the rest, to show their acuteness of wit and admirable breeding. The return this time from the spy's boatman was, you cuckoldy company of whiffling, peddling, lying, overreaching ninny hammers. And so it continued for about two pages, actually. <coughs> These insults utilise a number of common themes in personal abuse, defamation and libel, including accusations of sexual licence, cuckoldry and low breeding. The humour is rooted not only in their canting language and the way that it sends up reality, but also in the way that Ward caricatures the invectives and builds them to hyperbolic levels, each compounding what came before are more insulting than the last. As Beattie wrote, amplification is a source of humour, and as such, hyperboles are very common. And so one final source of laughter in which Ward often wallowed was this one, bawdiness and scatology. When commenting on the nature of jokes and people's sense of humour, Meyer was not alone in observing that taste often showed itself to be lower than the ideal standard set by the conduct manuals. Indeed, he commented that often things that were simply obscene rather than obviously ludicrous were laughed at never so heartily, even though it was against the decency of manners. He wrote, We shall scarce find a writer of satire and comedy that does not, at times, at least in appearance, write smutterly. Experience also teaches that a set of merry people scarce ever meet together, but at last they fall into loose and smutty discourse. Jests, in other respects, fine, when dashed with indelicacy, usually excite our laughter the most. And Ward is famously vulgar in his writing. In the 20th century editions of The London Spy, several passages were omitted specifically because they might shock or disgust the modern reader. I'm not going to labour the point, but not for nothing, it was Ward variously described as a lovable rogue, scurrilous though amusing, a diverting old boy, or as jovial, brutal, graphic, vulgar Ned Ward. And actually, when Macaulay turned to Ward's accounts as source material for his history of England, it was with some uh, regret, I suppose, and it had the inclusion of a footnote expressing his sense of shame for quoting what he considered to be nauseating balderdash but at least he recognised his value as source material, so not all that. So in, in Ward's works, there are tales of excrement flinging and practical jokes with urine resulting in the excessive laughter of the company. 
We also find in his secret history of clubs not only the sexual frisson of the board's initiating club, the Molly's Club and the Dancing Club, but also the wonderfully earthy delights of the Farting Club. At Islington, he described what happened when he went to relieve himself and accidentally went to the ladies. And bringing together surprise rhymes, incongruous narrative and juxtapositions of high and low, he wrote... And who should come running immediately after but a pretty young damsel to scatter her water, who being in haste had the scurvy mishap to thrust open the door and clap arse on my lap. Ads wounds, said I, lady fair as unchristian, I never deserve from your sex to be pissed on. And she took flight under some alarm, but Ward was apparently unperturbed and actually regretted only the darkness. I dare engage she'd a bum like a Venus, he added. A content like this is all the more interesting in light of Ward's readership, which, as I said, cut right across the social spectrum. Much has been made of a proposed widening gap between elite and popular culture opening up over the early modern period and into the 18th century. And Norbert Elias's civilising process set up a narrative of change, whereby the better sort distinguish themselves uh, through behavioural codes associated with civility and politeness and many later works have been built upon this model. The humour that I've just cited is certainly not polite, but the problem was that laughter was recognised as an instinctive response to the mental triggers that I've been outlining. As Beatty wrote, when certain objects, qualities or ideas occur to our senses, memory or imagination, we smile or laugh at them, and to do so is natural. Given its instinctive quality, laughter brought the struggle for bodily control and discretion sharply into focus, but it was not always necessary to win the battle, happily. Meyer's thoughts on jesting touched on this very issue. When he reflected on the generally loose and smutty nature of humour, he queried whether it is not allowable at times to introduce into jests something that clashes with the rules of decency and good manners. A ticklish question, it might have been, but ultimately he surmised that what is indecent at one time is not so at another. It was allowable in a joke suited to its context to forego the generally established principles of politeness. So in this respect, humour provides a window, perhaps almost like unlike any other, through which to identify areas where elite and popular culture were less distinct than has been previously supposed. It serves as a cautionary tale about the polite tastes of the polite classes. But the argument only stands if the readers and audiences can be uncovered. And that again underlines that history of humour should not stop with the comic material itself. I think taken together, all of this, um, I hope, should go some way to revising the standard interpretation of Ward as this quintessential Grub Street hack. His biographer wrote in 1946 that his talent in writing was essentially shallow, it was thin. Um, but, and, and that's actually been remarkably persistent. Um, in a period that's gone down as a golden age of satire, he still plays second fiddle to the likes of Swift, Pope, Addison, all of those kinds of characters. Even Daniel Defoe, who in many ways, they're quite, they lead parallel lives. But you can see in the ways that he's constructing his writing that he's actually quite skillful in what he's doing, and he did that to popular acclaim. Um, so, in some sense, I think he deserves a bit of credit and maybe a little of a rethink as well. So when considering Ward's publications as a whole, there are several humorous devices that are characteristic of his writing. Along with novelty, surprise, similes and incongruities, there are slang terms, contemporary speech, and he rightly deserves his reputation for scatological and bawdy content. These can be fairly easily catalogued, but the question of intention remains. Was it supposed to be funny? And how can we know? It's only by taking into account the contemporary theories of what triggered laughter that we can start to join the dots. By relating notions of what constituted wit and comic potential towards writing, we can uncover why he was so widely admired for his humour by his 18th century readers. So through Ward's writing, we can see how some of the theories of laughter and what constituted wit might have looked in practice. And these lead us towards Ward lead us towards Ward's knack of pleasing. And what I want to consider in the time that's remaining is the place of laughter um, and the, what it was thought to do in political debate and, uh, and social life. So to take the political first. The growing prominence of print in political culture in the early years of the 18th century is well known. There was an appetite for political news and debate among a reading public 
and Ward catered for it, carrying over his accessible humorous style into, into a political context. The prominence of satire in this period has earned it the epithet of the golden age of satire. Um, most commonly, it was thought to be a moral art form. By laughing people out of folly and vice, it hoped to uphold virtue in society. But its purpose and limits were live debates. An important contemporary distinction was between general satire and specific satire. The general was uh, something that fell into line with Erasmus's praise of folly and that tradition of satire. In the preface, Erasmus had written that, um, sorry, he advocated making witty reflections on the common errors of mankind, avoiding anyone in particular, the better to teach and admonish rather than to bite. And that was a common claim by the early 18th century. People would often write that they're not levelling at characters in particular, but in general terms. So you shouldn't take specific offence, but learn from it. Um, this problem, so laughing at people, had been associated with derisive ridicule long, long ago, since antiquity. And Thomas Hobbes's notion of laughter as sudden glory perpetuated this idea in the mid-17th century. He'd argued that laughter resulted from perceiving oneself in a superior light. It was a sneering self-applause that expressed contempt for others. So in terms of laughter and how people interact, it's obvious problems for um, sociability, I suppose. Targeting follies and vices in general terms would avoid the worst excesses of ridicule. But without specificity, <coughs> satire could be misinterpreted. As Jonathan Swift famously recognised, satire is a sort of glass wherein beholders do generally discover everybody's face but their own. And Alexander Pope agreed. Attacking vices in the abstract might be safe fighting, as he called it, but it was fighting at shadows. Without a, specific satire, without a specific target, satire could not hope to be effective. So what was acceptable in satire was not fixed, and in a political context, this was especially true after the lapse of press licensing. After 1695, the government had to rely on the law of seditious libel to combat offending print, and only after it had been published. And by looking at one of Ward's publications and his resulting date in court, we can connect the ideas about satire to unfolding events. <coughs> the publication in question is Hudibras Redivivus, which is a direct attempt to link his efforts with those of Butler, uh, which was a 12-part serial published monthly from August 1705. Ward was fiercely high church Tory in his politics, and the serial was written at a time when many of his persuasion were discontented at the Whig resurgence under Queen Anne's moderate Tory government. Humour was central to his purpose. As he wrote in the preface, sober methods, grave advice, and serious reproof have been to little purpose. So he resolved to apprehend vice after a jesting manner. And throughout the text, there are many of the same comic devices that we've already seen. Novelty and the unexpected were part and parcel of the Hudibrastic verse structure itself, which lent many opportunities for surprise rhymes. In the first number of the serial alone, Ward rhymed prevaricated with racked and baited, things in pulpits with listening dull pates, and even the multilingual couplet, I trudged along as fast codsooks as porter with a billet dukes is butchering the French to, to comic effect. There are many other examples of a similar sort. When Ward paired folly with holy, or lampoons and satires with ledger slatires, he was playing with a writer's ability to surprise his readers, to thwart their expectations in an incongruous manner that might excite their laughter. There was also much scatology, you'll be pleased to hear. Describing the horse upon which a guard sat astride, he began, excuse me, reader, that's my muse, should such indecent language use, before he continued. For every step he coughed and wheezed, farted extremely, often sneezed, and he, that he who follows him, sorry, that he who follows him must find, by the unsavoury whiffs behind, he'd nothing in his guts but wind, I suppose. And there was a healthy sprinkling of comic similes, which in this case were not just amusing, but they also helped to illustrate Ward's arguments that the Whigs were untrustworthy, self-interested, and power-hungry. A Whig, he wrote, was like a weathercock who turns his backside upon every wind, or a Thames waterman who looks one way but rows another. Although they would never admit it, the Whigs wanted all the kingdom could afford. 
just like true sots. The, uh, they will seem to have quenched their thirst after a single draught, but will soon crave the barrel, and the devil a drop they'll leave behind. Like a greedy mistress with her wealthy husband, they will always want more. An action was necessary to halt their schemes, since, like sponges thrown into water, if ignored, they would expand. The way to lessen them is to squeeze them. But he knew that he was skating on thin ice with all of this. Several of his friends and booksellers had already been arrested, and in part five of the serial, Ward dared the authorities to punish that high church scribe, Ned Ward. May all his pointed prose and rhyme be punished one day soon as crime. So he might not have been altogether surprised when he was duly arrested just days after those words were published. His trial was held in April 1706. This is a photograph of the, the records in the court of King's Bench. Um, and you can kind of almost picture the scene here. The court of, uh, well, Queen's Bench at the time, it's Queen Anne, assembled in Westminster Hall and the Attorney General, Sir Edward Northey, charged Ward with being a seditious, malicious and ill-disposed man, published of scandalous and seditious libels, who had assiduously and perpetually disturbed the peace and public tranquility of the realm. After announcing that certain seditious and scandalous matter appears in the following wording, Northey began quoting in court the passages that were deemed offensive. Out of the five parts that have been published to date, there were only very specific passages that were considered in court. Uh, they numbered around three to four pages in total. By comparing these with the majority of the text, it's possible to see where the government's patience ran out, to find the limits of toleration for satirical comment. And what becomes clear is that it was the very specific nature of the rebukes that left Ward open to charges of seditious libel. It was when he targeted specific laws and the Queen that he crossed the line. Although the court scribe did not adhere to the verse structure of the poem, Ward's comic <coughs> polysyllabic, bless you, polysyllabic and half rhymes cannot have escaped notice as his writing was read aloud in court. Northey began by quoting several passages in which Ward had attacked the act of toleration for allowing people to steer their course with much content towards heaven by an act of parliament. People could choose some way unknown because they're encouraged to it by wholesome laws. There was an impression that all worship right must be, but a purblind fool may see they're wrong to yield such liberty. In another passage, the Queen came under particular fire for failing to halt the Whig rise and protect the integrity of the Church of England, despite her earlier promises to do so. And Northey quoted, Fair speeches are a prince's talent, but then quid verba valent. That spoken words are fleeting. And like a friend so kindly spoke, had, had since put upon them such a joke. A sack of fair promises avail but little, like too rich pie crust, they are so brittle. Good deeds become an English heart. Fine words don't count avail a fart. So that's perhaps Ward's comic, uh, comic similes at their most politically impudent. The jury found Ward guilty of seditious libel, uh, and his fate was reported in the newspapers. There we are, Edward Ward, convicted of writing, printing, publishing several scandalous and seditious libels, Hudibras, Redivivus, highly reflecting upon Her Majesty and the government, was likewise fined, uh, she fined 40 marks and ordered to stand in the pillory on Wednesday next at Charing Cross for one hour, and then uh, with a paper on his head denoting his offence and again in the pillory at the Royal Exchange in Corn, uh, Cornhill, in the same way. Ward may have opted to make his point after a jesting manner, but it was no joke to the government. And looking at Ward's experience, it's possible to see how ideas about satire played out in a specific time and place, as he commented on unfolding events. Humour was used as a deliberate writing strategy. There was a market for political debate that was entertaining and accessible. And the investment in satire meant that it was thought to enhance the power of the argument being made. The threat that such writing was posed was identified and confronted in the courts. In a moment of political controversy, Ward's experience demonstrates the seriousness with which the government could treat uh, humorous interventions in public debate. The discussions about satire and its limits rumbled on, but by extending the inquiry into the courtroom, we can reconnect them to political uh, particular circumstances. And so finally then, one of the things that comes across in the surprise rhymes that Ward used 
is that they are best appreciated when, like I've been doing, they're read aloud. A couplet that he used to describe the insides of a tavern, for example, um, the tinkling of the bell at the bar, the grateful news of coming sar, it only comes across when it's spoken. And as a number of scholars have shown, uh, reading was often a sociable activity at this time. Simon Dickey's analysis of Jess books from the period emphasised that many imagined collective audiences, and as the frontispiece from one of them shows, people would gather around and share the jokes with one another. And if we turn to the theory for a final time, laughter was primarily thought to be a social phenomenon. It was often noted that people seldom laughed alone, but rather needed company to set their springs of gaiety into action. And indeed, laughing was thought to be contagious. Moreover, it was a complex communicative tool. It could be used to soothe tension after a dispute, a giggle in the corner could serve as bait to entangle a gazing lover, or a well-placed chuckle might show that you were in on a joke. And when Jonathan Swift wrote his treatise on polite conversation, in the preface he actually describes how he toyed with marking the moments in all the ideal dialogues of when people should laugh, but he basically decides that he's not going to do it because it would have enlarged the volume to such an extent it would have cost a fortune to publish and buy. But the point is, is that laughter was an important and frequent part in conversation. I mean, laughter is, after all, an observable anatomical activity that generally produces a sound. As such a noisy and physical action, like speech, it could foster and steer a sociable encounter. One writer typified a much wider sentiment when he insisted that we may as well think of separating wit from the 1st of April, or goose from Michaelmas Day, as that we can live at ease without <coughs> laughter, the chorus of conversation and the union of social intercourse. In the context of a growing drive for public sociability and associational life in the taverns, coffee houses, assembly rooms and pleasure gardens of the period, it was considered the worst of all crimes to be a, so a dullard. And so wit was highly valued. Thomas Hobbes had considered wit to be a celerity of imagining that stood opposed to dullness and stupidity. And the conditions in which he believed that it was most apt to flourish were indeed sociable. First was in familiar company, and secondly, under the effect of the wine. And both were points on which later writers agreed. Ward provides us with many accounts of these forms of sociability in his works. On one occasion in the London Spy, he chanced upon a gaggle of wits in a tavern, engaged in back and forth repartee. He joined the group to see what diversion they might afford. A glass or two of wine revived the drowsy spirits, and soon enough, he writes, wit begot wit, and wine a thirsty appetite to each succeeding glass. Songs and catches crowned the night, and there was verbal combat to the great laughter of the whole company. Some of their banter was improvised witticism, but some of it was lugged out of a pocket library, like a small book, which is indicative of the way in which the reading of texts often played a part in sociable encounters. Ward's writings like this are representations of social life rather than a direct account of it and should be read with a critical eye. But evidence of his own sociability suggests that he engaged in similar activities himself. His closest associates can be traced through references that they made to one another in their print and among their number were several other satirists. These included Tom Brown and William Pittis who were both contributors to one particular volume called Miscellanies Over Claret, which was self-professedly the work of four or five, some say honest, others foolish, but all say drunken fellows at the Rose Tavern without Temple Bar. Of Pittis, the publisher John Dunton wrote that his head is like an Irish bog, a spongy quagmire. His brains are in a perpetual sauce tub. He was a profound soaker. Tom Brown wrote an oration in praise of drunkenness which emphasised the power of wine to sharpen the wit and reinforce the bonds of friendship. And the liveliness of his humour reportedly rendered him, his company, among the most sought after in the town. William King was another of Ward's associates, and in a letter to Alexander Pope, his publisher Bernard Lintot recalled that King would write verses in a tavern three hours after he could not speak. And Ward himself acknowledged that as times go, I think it no great crime to own, that now and then, when business will permit, I love a <coughs> chirruping glass in the company of such friends to whom my own may be acceptable. In later life, 
Ward opted to name his own tavern, the Bacchus, after the good-natured god of wine, and it was there that reports tell us he offered his guests a pleasurable entertainment with his wit as well as his good liquor. As I mentioned earlier, wit had a strong association with mental agility. It was an intellectual ability to perceive a humorous opportunity that others might have spotted, and then to delight them with it. This was encapsulated in the concept of ingenuity, the quickness and creativity of thought, and each of these men were associated with it. Brown's talent was considered to be ludicrous, though ingenious, and he was read and known by name to the ingenious of all ranks. After King's death in 1712, he was remembered as the late and ingenious Dr. William King, while another literary biographer admired the ingenious method by which he had written his journey to London. Similarly, Ward was admired by Dunton not just as Ward, but as Ingenious Ward, the famous author of The London Spy. Significance of wit and sociability meant that Ward had a knack for pleasing not just his readers, but also his Grub Street peers and fellow wits of the town. And so through Ward's life and works, ideas about laughter can be related to the context of people, places and circumstances. In his writing, his brush with the law and his sociability, contemporary debates and theories of laughter can be traced through into social practice. But by way of conclusion, what I wanted to do was to push a little bit further on what's historically specific about all of this. Because the trouble is, is that some of Ward's writing is still amusing, or at least I think it is. Um, he has an enduring appeal that, prevent, that presents a little bit of a problem for the history of humour. As I started out with, the things that we see fit to laugh at, so the argument goes, are varied with time, place and culture. But this is only convincing up to a point. Laced with comic similes and bawdy imagery and scatological cheer, Ward's writing exemplifies much that was thought to be diverting to 18th century readers, but the tropes and, dev and devices that structured his comic material are still recognisably humorous today. Just as they did in the 18th century, the causes and significances of laughter still intrigue psychologists, anthropologists, sociologists and philosophers today, and on several points, modern ideas are remarkably consistent with those in the 18th century. The first point is that Hutchison and Beattie's notion of incongruity as a cause of laughter remains one of three key theories that have persisted, persisted into the present. And as such, the merits, are still, the merits of the idea are still debated in modern scholarship. Identifying a similarity between two ostensibly different objects was recognised as the essence of wit from Hobbes through to Beattie, but as recently as 2013, an article was published in the International Journal for Humour Research called Humorous Similes. And it argued that humorous descriptions are often couched in the form of a simile. Such constructions allow an author to yoke a topic to a perspective that is, at both, that is both at once incongruously different and yet appropriately similar. In that sense, he's almost exactly paralleling what Hobbes and Beattie and, and the others have said before him. The same is also true of scatological and bawdy content. The 18th century theorists were all too aware that a dash of indelicacy might excite laughter, but this was also still being argued into the late 20th century. Gershon Legman's book, The Rationale of the Dirty Joke, which is a great read, I think, uh, maintained that erotic humour is far and away the most popular of all types, and the humour of scatology must be assimilated into this, if only because both operate under the same physiological and verbal taboos. If we extend the discussion beyond the triggers of laughter and into its perceived significance in social and political life, we can also find modern arguments that are analogous to those made in the 18th century. That laughter is social and infectious is still a common claim, as is the notion that a satirical tone has particular persuasive and communicative powers, indeed especially so in the digital age of internet memes and things that can go viral. Um, oops. One anthropologist's observation that clearly laughter is a powerful and pervasive part of our lives would have received as sympathetic a reading in Ward's time as it does today. But through Ward, or probably any other individual, but I've done it through Ward, we can see how these theories played out in a specific time and place. And it's here that we find the historical specificity of laughter and humour. 
While we can understand the jokes, and even find some amusing, they are very much the product of Ward's world and not ours. His comic similes were fashioned from a stock of images that were drawn from the everyday sights and sounds of his culture. A hen's fundament, a Deptford cheesecake, and a muscovy cat's turd are unusual by modern standards, but in a way that might baffle rather than excite laughter by the rarity of their invention. The same is true of his use of cant and slang terms, and when uh, an edition of the London Spy was published in 1993, it had a glossary attached to the end of it to help decipher Ward's writing. And again, the, the same case with the frequency and intensity of the uh, bawdy and scatological content that he used. Similarly, although laughter has retained an important place in social life, the celebration of wit in sociability and its connection to drunkenness had significances particular towards time. And the level of sensitivity to political satire and the ways in which it was suppressed are equally tied to his context. So in light of all this, the argument for the historical specificity of humour and laughter needs qualifying, or certainly stopping short of any claims to sort of universalist arguments when we actually consider the theoretical perspectives, the perceived triggers of laughter have been repeated over the centuries. The notion that laughter has consequence in social and political life also shows striking continuity. Yet, through Ward's life and works, it's possible to pursue these theories into social practice, to see how they played out in the context of his time and place. The images, topics and themes that Ward played on were shaped by his own imaginative horizons, uh, and the resulting laughter, and the way that resulting laughter was thought about, celebrated, tolerated, or suppressed, was also a product of the attitudes, anxieties, and sensibilities of his time. And so, while we might still be able to perceive the jokes, there was a culture of humour that was specific to the early 18th century. Thank you for listening.